Hey, welcome to the lecture 4 on module 3 for ARM embedded systems, ARM microcontroller and embedded systems. So in lecture 3 we discussed about the sensors and actuators, so the inputs and the outputs that are usually used in embedded systems. So now we shall discuss about this communication interface. Okay, so what are the various communication interfaces available in an embedded system or used in an embedded system? Yeah, so coming to the communication interface. The communication interface is essential for communicating with various subsystems of the embedded system and with external world. So what it says is it is the communication interface is uh, used for communication within the embedded system as well as with the external world also. So there are two types of communications that will take place in a embedded system. So within the embedded system and outside the embedded system that is from the embedded system with the external world. So for an embedded product the communication interface can be viewed in two different perspectives as I told. So first one is device or board level communication which is known as on board communication interface. So this is on board means it is device or board level that is whatever the communication that happens within the embedded system, the, within the components of the embedded system. So that is what is known as board level or on board communication interface. And one more is product level. So product level means external communication interface. So what do you mean by external? So let's say your embedded product wants to communicate with one more embedded product which is not uh, near to it, which is let's say far away from it. So how will you communicate? How that particular embedded product communicates with one more embedded product? So that is product level. So it is uh, an embedded system is trying to communicate with some other product which is not on the board which is available outside the board okay so that is what is external uh, communication interface okay so example let's say you all all know about raspberry pi right so raspberry pi it's a soc system on chip uh, which has a processor which has a, uh, the working memory which has uh, the interface like usb wi-fi right so why is wi-fi used Suppose you want to communicate uh, from your PC to your Raspberry Pi, so you can do that communication using the Wi Fi. So, that Wi Fi is a product level communication interface or external communication interface because you are trying to communicate from the embedded system to some other product, so which is your PC. So, that is what is product level. Okay, so device level means, so let's say, as I told you, the Raspberry Pi has a working memory or uh, let's say RAM. So the RAM, uh, the pro how the processor communicates with the RAM, which is available on board itself, on the chip itself. So the RAM and the processor are on the same chip itself. But even though they are on the same chip, they need some media to communicate with each other. So what is that media? What is that interface? That is known as on board communication interface. So now embedded product is combination of different types of components as a so, like chips or device arranged arrange on a PCB. So, the communication channel which interconnects the various components within an embedded system is referred as device or board level, or which is also known as on board communication interface, as I told. The communication between the processor and the RAM that is available. So, both are available on the same chip or the PCB, but still they have they have to be there has to be some channel or media through which they communicate with each other. So such interface is known as onboard interface. Okay, so examples of onboard communication interfaces are you can say I square C, SPI, UART, one wire, okay, and parallel bus. So these are all the examples for onboard communication interfaces. So this using these communication interfaces, the various components or the chips that are uh, available on the same PC that are present on the same PCB that is print up circuit board communicate with each other. 
okay so the next type of interface is external communication interface external or it is also known as product level so where it is responsible for data transfer between embedded system so you put that embedded system and other devices or modules other devices or modules so as i told example is suppose you want to communicate from your pc to raspberry pi you can do that using wi-fi interface so wi-fi is a product level interface or external communication interface because you are trying to communicate data from an embedded system with other devices which is not available on the same pc that other device that you want to communicate is not available on the same pcb okay it can also be so you might have uh, you might are familiar with uh, the raspberry pi having usb ports right so what are these usb ports used for suppose you want to connect connect a uh, let's say um, a mouse usb mouse or a usb keyboard so what are these usb mouse and usb keyboard they are peripherals they are not present on the raspberry pi they are they have to be connected externally so usb also becomes a external communication interface okay hope you are getting this so the external communication interface can be either so this interface can be wired or wireless so this is about external not internal okay so internal communication interfaces are always wired they are not wireless but external communication interfaces can be wired or wireless so wired example i told usb right usb is a wired communication interface so now wireless is as i told it can be wi-fi it can be a bluetooth or it can be infrared also and these these interfaces can be a serial communication interfaces or parallel communication interface so in serial what happens the data is transmitted one bit after the other serial one after the other but in parallel that is not the case so you can send multiple bits simultaneously so next so lan also comes so is wireless lan which is wifi so rf that is the radio frequency gprs so all these are wireless external communication interfaces these are external not internal okay so internal as i told are always wired so other examples of wired external communication interfaces rs232 so usb as i told ethernet then some parallel port so this is uh, your uh, you can say the card reader slot like that example so wired external interfaces external communication interface so this rs232 is always is almost gone now so very few uh, use it so now we'll first talk about in this lecture we'll talk about on board communication interface so why is on board communication interface used for communication within the board that is there are various devices connected within the board okay so how they communicate with each other using on board communication interface so i'll show you a diagram here so this is a picture of raspberry pi so we might already be familiar with this you can see the various components that are available on this so this is the processor okay or you can say the system core uh, it's a uh, it's the processor so this processor Uh, along with this processor on this chip you can see the ram here the working memory ram so then you can see the hdmi connector okay? and you can see the camera connector so this is a camera connector and there is a 3.5 mm audio jack okay? and there is a ethernet ethernet uh, uh, can say slot and these are the usb slots fine okay? so and these are the io ports available for this board So all these uh, whatever the devices or components are placed on the single PCB. You can see the PCB. Okay? So now the question is how this processor, which is available here, communicates with the memory, which is available somewhere else, but on the same board. So how these two communicate? So that is what these two communicate using on-board communication interfaces. These are on-board. So because they are present on the same board and they want to communicate with each other. So that's interface known as on-board communication interface. Similarly, this communicates with the camera interface also, the processor and the camera interface, the processor and the USB also it communicates uh, with the USB ports. The processor also communicates with the Ethernet port. It also communicates with the HDMI port. So all so all these come under what is this? All these come under on-board communication interfaces.
Yeah, so now we'll discuss what are the various onboard communication interfaces. The first one is I square C. So it is read as I square C, pronounced as I square C. So it is integrate. What is the name? Uh, what is the full form? Is I? What it is I square means? It is inter integrated circuit. So that is why it is I square. So there are two I's inter integrated circuit bus. So it is a. So what type of interface it is it? It is synchronous, bidirectional, half duplex. Okay, so it is synchronous communication. First thing, bidirectional. Bidirectional means communication can take place in both the uh, directions, and then half duplex means. One direction at a time, so it is not full duplex. It is half duplex. So it is at a given point of time. Whenever two devices are communicating with each other, so either uh, the communication is one direction. So it is, let's say, from device one to two, or from device two to one, but not simultaneously. So that is what is one directional communication at any given point of time. And how many wires it has? It has two wire. Serial interface and it is a serial communication interface. It is serial. Okay, so what is this synchronous? It is synchronous, bidirectional, half duplex, and it has two wires and it is serial. Serial means as I told, one bit at a time. The communication takes place one bit at a time. So next, this concept is not new. It was introduced in 1980s itself by Philips. So it was originally developed for communication interface uh, for communication. Between the processor of the controller and the peripheral chips of a TV or a television sets, so it is not a new concept, old concept. So this I square bus, I square C bus is comp is comprised of two lines, as I told. So the first line is known as SCL or serial clock, and second line is SDA or serial data. Okay, serial clock or serial data. So next SCL, what is as I told SCL? As the name itself indicates, it is responsible for generating synchronous clock pulses. So it is, it will generate clock pulses for synchronization. Why? Because it is synchronous communication. It is not a, a synchronous, asynchronous. It is synchronous. And SDA is responsible for data transmission. So out of two lines, one is for clock, and one more is for data communication. Okay. So I square C bus is a shared bus system. To which many number of I square C devices can be connected. So this I square C, so there there can be many uh, devices connected to the same bus. So it uh, it is not necessary that only there are two devices. There can be three, four, five like that. So devices connected on I square C bus can act either as master or slave. So there is a concept here: master or slave. So what do you mean by this, master or slave? So one device will initiate the communication process, and one or the other device will just uh, respond to the uh, whatever the commands given by the device which initiates the uh, data communication. That is what is mean by master or slave. So it is master or slave. So next, the master device is responsible for controlling the communication, as I told. By initiating or terminating the data transfer, sending the data, and generating necessary clock pulses. Yeah, so always the master controls the initiation and termination of the data transfer, send data, and then gen also generate the required clock pulses. Since it is synchronous communication, so remember as soon as it is synchronous, there will be a clock for the communication purpose. So next, so once master initiates the Communication slave device waits for the commands from the master. So slave does not do anything; it only waits for the command for the master. And once the commands are received, it will respond upon receiving the commands. That is, it will send some acknowledgments to the master, saying that I have received so and so commands. So acknowledgments are very necessary. Why? Because the master has to come to know whether the transmission was successful or not. Okay, so that is why. The acknowledgments are very much required. So it is just like your registered post, wherein you uh, do a registered post, and while doing the registered post, you write the from address onto a separate, you can say, acknowledgment. Right. So once that package gets delivered, that acknowledgment will will be delivered back to you, saying that the package was successfully delivered to the destination. So like that. So these are slave devices and the acknowledgment. 
The master and slave devices can act as either a transmitter or receiver. So what do you mean by this? See, as I told, master initiates the data transmission, right? Okay, it initiates the data transmission. The data transmission can, can be of two types. That is, either the master can send the data and slave can receive it or the reverse can also happen. That is, the master will receive the data and slave will send the data. So that is why he says master and slave either can be transmitter or receiver. So if master sends the data and slave receives the data, so then it is the master is the transmitter and the slave is the receiver. And if the case is reversed, that is if master receives the data, so then master will become the receiver. And if slave is sending the data, so then the slave becomes the transmitter. That is what is the meaning. So regardless whether the master is acting as transmitter or receiver, the synchronization clock signal is generated by the master only. So the master device, that is the device which initiates the uh, whatever the transmission, data transmission, that is responsible for generating the clock signal. Remember this, always master generates the clock signal. So I square C supports multi masters on the same bus. So there can be multiple masters on the same bus, but there is a a requirement. So what is that requirement? So at a, at a given point of time, only one device acts as a master. So they cannot, there cannot be two masters simultaneously. At any given point of time, only one master is possible. So this is, you can see, the arrangement of I square C bus, you can see there are two uh, lines, so SCL and SDA. And you can see both are connected to VCC through a current limiting register. So what is the meaning of this? So the lines SCL and SDA, SDA are, uh, you can say, normally uh, giving a logic 1 voltage. Okay, They are at logic 1. So they are at logic 1 normally. Okay, if nothing is happening, they are both are at logic 1. So you can see, this is the master, which is the processor of the controller, which has again two pins, two ports. So one is for SDA and one, one is for SCL. And you can see these are the two slave devices, slave 1 and slave 2. Slave 1 is a memory, you can see serial EE prom means it's a memory. Okay, we have discussed about EE prom, electrically erasable. So it is a uh, memory uh, which is uh, which supports I square C protocol. And slave 2 device is one more device which also supports I square C protocol. So like this, there can be many slaves. Right? So again, they are having SCL and SD. So this is the connection configuration of I square C. So how the data communication starts or initiates? So there, are, there is a particular sequence of operation for that. Okay. So what is the first step? So master device pulls the clock line of SCL of the bus to high. Okay. So so already SCL will be high. When right? SCL will be high. So it will make the SSL high. Okay? Then what will happen? Master, the microcontroller with processor device pulls the data line SDA low when the SCL line is at high. So this is this marks the start condition. So what, what does this mean? So I have a diagram for this. This is here. So can you see this? So first uh, the master may, uh, makes the SCL line high. So this is the SCL line high. Can you see this? High, it is high, logic one. So at the same time, whenever SCL is high, the master pulls the SDA line to low. So can you see this? It is pulled down to low. So still SCL is high and it will pull the SCL to SDA to low. So this marks the start condition. Okay, SDA goes low before SCL. You can see that. Right? So this is what he's talking about. So this is the start condition. Then after the start condition, master sends address. So the address can be 7 bit or 10 bit. So what is this address? So that since there are two slave devices, it has to select with which slave device it wants to communicate, whether slave 1 or slave 2. So each device will be given an address. Okay. So it is just like the house addresses uh, or the door number for each house. So which door number you want to send the uh, let's say the uh, registered post when so that address is 7 bit or 10 bit it can be 7 bit or 10 bit which is a slave device to which it wants to uh, communicate right 
over the SDA line. So where this 7 bit address will be sent over the SDA line. So you can see the SDA line. So after initiation, it is sending the 7 bit address. So A6, A5, A4, A3, A2, A1, A0. So totally 7 bits from initiating from what is this? MSB. First MSB is sent and then the last bit is LSB. So that is what he says. Okay. So clock pulses are generated at SCL line synchronizing the bit reception. Fine. So the MSB of the data is sent first. So that is what I told sent first. So the data in the bus is valid. So when is the data valid? During high period of clock signal. So during only high period the data on the SDA line is valid. So what is the, what do you mean by this? So see here the SCL, the clock. So you can see the clock signals, how many are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So to send 7 bit address, 7 clocks are required. And when the addresses are valid, whenever the clock signal is high. So at this particular point, A6 is read by the slave. Okay, so A5 is read by the slave, A4 is read by the slave. So that is what it means. So once the address is sent, so the address will be received by both slave 1 as well as slave 2. So both will receive the same address and whichever device has that address, so whichever, de whichever device corresponds to that particular address sent by the master, so that will respond. So if the address sent by the master corresponds to slave 2, so only slave 2 will respond. Slave 1 will not respond. It will compare the address received with the address with the address of itself and whichever address is true that slave will respond. Next. So after sending the 7 bits of address, master sends the read or write bit. So whether the operation is read or write this slave device. So if it sends 1, that means it is read and if it sends 0, that means it is write operation. So I will show that here. So after 7 bits of address A6 to A0. So this is the R, w, R, sl, R slash W bit. So uh, whether this master wants to read the data from the slave or it wants to write the data to the slave. So that is what is this. Okay. So after this, once this is sent totally 8 bits, let's say, so master waits for the acknowledgement. So as I told, so master wants to know whether the address that it has sent, it has been communicated properly with the read-write selection. So from the slave device. So the slave device whose address is sent along the bus with the read write operation command. So then the slave device connected to the bus compare the address received with the address assigned to them. Okay, so they compare the address that is received on the SDA line to the address available with them. So the slave device with address requested response. Okay, so how it responds by giving an acknowledgement bit what is a bit bit one it will send a bit one which is the acknowledgement bit on sda line so you can see the sda line so this is the acknowledgement bit so this is logic one so it sends one to the uh, master saying that i have received the address and i'm ready to transmit the data or receive the data so next upon receiving the acknowledgement master sends eight bit of data to the slave Okay, so over SDA line, so it will send 8 bits of data and it is serial communication, remember, 1 bit at a time. So if it is write operation, then the master sends the data to the slave and if it is read operation, so then the slave sends the uh, data to the master, okay, on the which line, SDA line. So all the data communication takes place on the SDA line. So see, you can see the 8 bits of data communicated depending on whether it is read or write. So again, the MSB of the data is sent first and then the LS. So after the data communication is done, so master waits for acknowledgement again from slave upon byte transfer complete. So once the data transfer is completed, again it will waits for the acknowledgement. So you can see the acknowledgement here given by the slave device. Okay. And once and once the acknowledgement is received, so then master comes to know that. The data transfer is complete, so master terminates the transfer by pulling the SDA line high. So SDA line is pulled high. So here, so from zero it is pulled to high. So this is where it completes the or it is the 
completion of termination of the communication stop. This is how I square C works. So next one more onboard communication interface is SPI or it is also known as serial peripheral interface. So as the name itself indicates, it is serial only. Okay, and similar to I square C, it is also serial. You can see the data are sent bit wise, one bit after the other. That is what is known as serial communication. So SPI, what is this SPI? Again, it is synchronous. Again, it is bidirectional, but it is full duplex. Okay. So previously, if you compare this to I square C, I square C was half duplex, but this is full duplex. And how many wires it uses? It uses it uses four wires. So I square C used only two wires. Now it, it uses four wires. Again, it is serial only. Right? So this was first introduced by Motorola. The concept was introduced by Motorola. So it is single master multi-slave. So again, it is master slave arrangement. So it is possible to have uh, more than one SPI device as master. Okay. So but what is the condition? Provided the condition is only one master device is active at a given point of Time. So at any given point of time, there cannot be multiple masters. There can be only one master and multiple slaves. So it has four lines. So what are the lines? So MOSI, which is master out slave in. So what is what is this used for? So as the name itself indicates. So whenever the master wants to send data to the slave, so this is the line that is used. Master out. So this is master is sending the data out and slave is receiving the data in. So here. Signal line carrying data from master to slave device. It is also known as slave input or slave data in. Okay. It is SI or SDI. So both are same. So next line is master in slave out. So as the name again indicates, what is this? So this line is used whenever the slave is sending the data out and master is receiving the data in. So that is MI SO. It is also known as slave out or slave data out okay both are same so one more is yes clock which is clock signal for synchronous communication because it is synchronous communication there should be a clock right and then is slave select so there is a slave select signal to select the slave that with which it wants to communicate so if there are four slaves in the arrangement there will be four slave select signals i'll show the diagram now so can you see this diagram this is the diagram. So MOSI, master out, slave in. SSL is the clock. MIS, master in, slave out. Okay. So you can see there are my two slaves here. So since there are two slaves, to select these two slaves, there are two slave select signals. So SS1 bar and SS2 bar. So the slave select signals are active load signals. They are active load signals. Yeah, so how the communication takes place. So the master device is responsible again for clock generation similar to I square C. Master device selects the required slave signal, sorry, slave device by asserting the slave select signal low. So as I told, it is active low. So to select a slave device, you have to output a logic zero. So suppose you output a logic zero here. So that means you are selecting slave one, selecting slave one. Then uh, the data out line MISO of all slave devices when not selected floats at high impedance. Okay. So then the serial data transmission through SPI bus is fully configurable. So uh, the data transmission is fully configurable. SPI devices contain set of registers for holding configurations. So each SPI device contains some configuration registers which will hold the settings. So we can change the parameters like uh, how the so what is the baud rate? Okay, so what is the clock control signal? So you can change this. So baud rate is nothing but the speed with which the data transmission takes place. Okay, so that is very important. Serial communications and whenever it is asynchronous. Okay, so SPI works on the principle of shift register. So principle is shift register. So what do you mean by that is? So each device contains a shift register. So this processor or controller which supports SPI also has a 
shift register so it will have a shift register here so the shift register here so this device will also have a shift register okay so like this so this will also have a shift register like this so what is the width usually the width of the shift register is multiple of eights okay so it is multiple of eights so it can be 8 bits 16 bits then 24 bits like that okay so multiple of eights so what will happen is suppose this master uh, wants to send the data to this slave so how it will send it so this since it is let's say a yeah, multiple of 8 so i will consider 8 bit shift register so let's say the data is 1 1 1 0 0 0 so 1 1 so this is the data that needs to be sent so how it will be done is so first the lsb will be shifted out so where it will be shifted out to the master out slave in pin why because master is outputting the data and slave is receiving the data so this one will be shifted out on a MOSI line and the slave will receive this one bit for it. so the one bit it will receive because okay, so as soon as it will receive one bit so next bit will be shifted out so this one so as soon as this bit is shifted out so this bit will be shifted to the right okay and new bit will be received so like this shift the register the operation will take place okay one bit at a time and remember here uh, compared to i square c where msb was for shifted out but here first lsb will be shifted out so this is the difference so this is what is the concept of shift register okay so the size of shift register is device dependent but it is usually normal of uh, normally multiple of it during transmission uh, data in so master shift register is shifted out so whenever master is sending the data using MIOSO pin so that is what I explained this is how the communication takes so the next onboard communication interface is UART okay, so you might, uh, you might be familiar with this universal asynchronous receive transmit UART okay, so it is the name itself indicates it is asynchronous and it is serial communication Okay. So here it is, it is asynchronous serial data transfer. So, so, so since it is asynchronous, there is no clock, concept of clock here, but the concept of baud rate comes in. So there is speed at which the data is transmitted or data transmission takes place. So the baud rate should be set to same between the both the devices that are using UART. Both the devices which are using UART. So what are the settings of the com serial communication? So baud rate, number of bits per byte, that is what is the width of the data you are trying to communicate, whether it is 8 bits, 10 bits, then whether it will be followed by a parity bit and how many start and stop bits will be there. So all these come under communication, serial communication settings. And you can see here both transmitter and receiver should be set as identical. The settings should be same. So next the start and stop communication is indicated through inserting special bits in the data stream okay so some special bits will be inserted in the data bits to indicate start and stop so while sending a byte of data a start bit is added first so first the start bit will be added then the stop bit will be added stop bit will be added at the end of the stream okay so the lsb of the bit of data is transferred first Okay, so again, it is similar to is that SPI. So LSB of the data that you want to send will be sent first, not the MSB, LSB. So next, the start bit informs receiver that data byte is about to arrive. So the receiver starts to pull the receive line as per the baud rate. Okay, so how many bits per second? How many bits will be received per second? That is what is the baud rate. So if parity is enabled, so UART of the transmission transmitting device adds the parity. So what is the use of parity? So it is used for data. Uh, you can say uh, uh, whether any uh, data transmission error has taken place. For error checking, it is used. So for example, I'll just give an example. So let's say the data you are sending is one zero, one zero, one zero, one one. So this is totally eight bits. So let's say the parity bit to use this E1 parity. So what will that do is after 8 bits it will insert one more bit which is which will indicate the parity. So what is the parity since we are considering E1 parity? 
So if the number of ones in the sent data is E1, so then let's say the parity bit will be set to 1. So how many bits are there here? 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So they are odd. So since the number of bits in the sent data is odd, so let's say a 0 will be sent. It is E1 parity I'm saying. So after receiving 8 bits, okay, uh, the next bit the receiver will receive this parity bit. So it will, if it is 0, so then the receiver comes to know that whatever the data is it has received, in that the number of ones should be odd. Okay, the number of ones should be odd. So th that is how it will check the data, right? The received data. So if well during the transmission, so, so because of some error, this one has been received to zero. So then how many ones will be there now? One, two, three, four. So only four ones. But the bar parity bit is saying that the number of ones should be odd. So the receiver comes to know that the data it has received is wrong. Okay, so then what it will do is it will ask for retransmission. So that is the use of parity bit. So the UART of receiving device calculates parity, whatever I told, bits received and compares it with the received parity bit for error checking. So that is what is what I told just now. Okay. <coughs> so once the uh, data transmission is complete, the start, stop, and parity bits are discarded. So they will not be consider they will be discard. So this is the arrangement of what is this uh, UART. So you can see there are only two pins TXD, RXD, TXD, RXD. So both are the UART devices. But here the connections the connections are cross coupled. Can you see this? The TXD pin of this is connected to RXD pin of this. And the TXD pin of the second device is connected to the RXD pin of the first device. Okay, so they are cross coupled connections. You have to remember this. So, next, the fourth type of onboard communication is one wire. So, still now we discussed about I square C, SPI, and UART. So, now it is one wire. So, as the name itself indicates, it is one wire means only one wire is used for data communication. Okay, so till now we, we saw two wire, four wire, two wires, and now it is one wire. So it, was, it is what is this? It is again a asynchronous half duplex, so one one way communication at any given point of time. And it was developed by Maxim Maxim Dallas Semiconductor. So it is the company name. Okay, asynchronous half duplex. So UART is also asynchronous and the one wire is also asynchronous. So it is also known as Dallas One Wire Protocol. So it is as the name it indicates, single line is used for data communication and that line is known as DQ. So all the communication takes place on the same, same line and it all again ma follows master-slave communication model. So one wire interface supports, so it is it supports only one slave, sorry one master and multiple slaves. So this one wire is also capable of carrying power also. Okay, so within one wire, it, power, power, it will carry the power as well as data. So how it will carry the power? So each yes, each slave device will have an internal capacitor which will charge as and when the data comes. So as and when you send the data, the device also will get the charge. So and it is capable of generating power for operating using this charge. So it is. So each one wire device that supports one wire communication has 64 bit address. So or it, it is, you can say that it is a identification number. <coughs> it will have a 64 bit identification number. So it is nothing but the address. So out of the 64 bit, so 8 bit will be the family code, 48 bit will be the serial number, and 8 bits is the CRC, cyclic redundancy check. So what is the CRC is again used for error checking. Okay, so the previous case we used parity bit for a new order, right? So similarly here, CRC is used for error checking. So how the communication takes place? Okay, so here communication takes place in terms of <coughs> you can say uh, yeah. So we'll go through this. Master device sends reset pulse on the one wire uh, bus. So there is a reset pulse first sent, 
which uh, indicates that it is the start of the communication. So after the reset pulse, uh, slave device present on the bus respond to the presence pulse. So that is uh, the, the slaves respond that I, we are present on the bus. So if there are two slave devices, two presence pulse will be received by the master. So then after re receiving the presence pulse, master sends the 64 bit address because there are multiple slaves, right? So there are multiple slaves, you can see here, multiple slaves. So the master will send the 64 bit address on the same line, DQ line itself. Okay. So let's say that address corresponds to this slave 2. So, so only slave 2 will respond after the address. So master device sends ROM command to 64 bit address. So the address is slave device to which it wants to communicate the uh, data. So next, master device sends read or write command. So once it sends the address, it will tell the slave whether it is the read or write function. Either will read or write means if the master wants to send the data to slave, it is write. Okay, so it is viewed in perspective of the master. If the master wants to send the data to slave, it is write. And if the master wants to receive the data from the slave, it is read. Okay, and then the communication starts. So all communication over one wire bus is master initiated. Again, the master has to initiate the communication. So the communications are divided into time slots of 60 microseconds. So there are time slots of 60 microseconds. So like this. So there are time slots like this. Okay. So what is the time slot? Each time slot. What is the uh, time? So it is 60 microseconds. So each time slot is 60 microseconds. So from here to here, then from here to here, 60 microseconds. Because there is no clock here, it is asynchronous. So reset pulse occupies eight time slots. You can see. So reset will occupy eight such time slots. So it is totally reset will be equal to eight into 60 microseconds, so which is 86 of 48. So it is 480 microseconds so one reset pulse will be equal to 480 microseconds so that is how the devices will come to know whether it is a reset pulse or not if the reset pulse is less than this or if any pulse is less than this so it is not considered as reset pulse okay so for starting a communication the master asserts reset pulse okay by pulling the data sorry whatever the uh, dq line low why it has to pull the dq line low because by default, the DQ line is high. It is connected to VCC. Okay. So it will pull it low for at least eight time slots, so which is 480 microseconds. So the, the, that is how the slave device come to know that it is a, a reset pulse. Okay. So next, if slave device present on the bus is ready and uh, for communication, it will respond with the presence pulse as it would, and within 60 microseconds. So within 60 microseconds of the reset pulse, the slave device has to respond with presence pulse. Okay. So then the slave device responds with the present pulse. So how it will respond? Again, it will pull the DQ line low for how many time slots? For at least one time slot. So for at least 60 microseconds, it will pull the DQ line low. That is how the presence pulse is given. Okay. So this is how the data will take place then to write a one so master will pull the bus for one to 15 microseconds and then release the bus so then suppose you want to write a one so how will you write a one means so this is one time slot right so from here to here 16 microseconds so this is the dq line so then to write a one the master will pull this line to low okay so for how much time at least 15 microseconds and then it will again pull up the line so this will be for at least a minimum of 15 microseconds so this is this will mark a one okay so this is how logic one is transmitted so what about lo uh, logic zero how logic zero is transmitted so a bit value of zero is written on the bus by pu master pulling the bus for minimum of one time slot and maximum of two slot times. 
so to write a zero so this line will be pulled down for at least 60 microseconds 60 microseconds so this is a zero this is one and this is zero so this is how the data communication takes place so data communication is time bound here so depending on how much time the dq line is low or high determines whether it is zero or one that is transmitted so this is about the one wire communication. So next the last onboard communication interface is parallel interface. This is the last onboard communication interface that we will study here. So parallel interfaces are normally used for communicating with peripheral devices which are memory mapped. Okay, so with memory mapped means uh, the address of the device is already uh, or the device, whatever the device that you want to access, suppose you want to access a printer or a scanner, so that is memory mapped. Okay, so the device can be accessed as a normal uh, memory uh, location. So that is what we mean by memory map. To access a device just like a memory, you memo you memory map the device. So the most the host processor or controller of the embedded system contains parallel bus. Uh, and the device which supports parallel bus can directly connect to this bus. So that is what parallel. So till now we considered serial communications. Now it is parallel. So communication through parallel bus is controlled by control signal interface and the device and the host. So there are some control signals that are used for communication or uh, controlling the communication. So what are these control signals? So this signal includes read and write control and device to device device select signals so these are the different control signals so usually the device normally contains device select line so it is just like spi so wherein there will be uh, device select signals so you can see this is the arrangement for parallel communication so this is the processor or the controller which is the host you can see there is a data bus here okay so what is the width of the data bus it is d0 to dx minus 1 Yes, the data width is d0 to dx minus 1. So, what is x? x is the data bus width. Suppose x is, uh, let's say, 8. So, it is d0 to d7. So, totally the data bus, the data bus will be 8 bits. Okay. So, similarly, address also. So, there is an address decoder here. So, what is the use of address decoder? So, whenever there are, um, let's say, many uh, devices, many devices, to select among those devices, you require a decoder. Fine. So let's say there are uh, two more devices here. Okay, so one and two. So totally, there are three devices. So what will happen to select these three devices? You require separate select signals or chip select signals. Instead of that, you send the address to the decoder, which will take care of which is the device that needs to be selected. So let's say the address you have sent is zero one. So this is the address you sent. So this address decoder will decode it to whether this device 1, device 2 or device 3. So let's say 0, 1 means it is device 2. So it will enable device 2 for the communication. And this data bus will be shared with device 2 as well as device 3. Same data bus will be shared. There are no separate data bus. So depending on which device is selected, that device will communicate using data bus. This is the arrangement. Okay. This is the use of decoder circuit. Yeah, so it contains the chip select signal. You can see this is the chip select, so it is an active low signal usually. Yeah, so once the chip is selected, then read or write operation takes place using this data bus. So this is about the uh, onboard communications, onboard communication interface. So in the next lecture, we shall discuss about external communication interfaces. So thank you.